Bots recently released a new C++ library for commanding and monitoring Modius controllers to match the long-standing Python library. I figured this gives me an opportunity to both talk about the C++ library and make some interesting demonstrations showing how the C++ API can be used to implement various dynamic actuation models. This turned out to be a long project. It is intended to be watched straight through as I talk through how to use the library and where to find useful reference information. However, I ended up breaking it into two videos. You can check in the description for a link to the second episode if it's been released, and you can use the seek bar to skip to the final demonstration from this episode if you don't care how it was built. The Modius Python library has been around for some time. It has a relatively simple API that works with one or more Modius controllers using a variety of transport methods like FDCANUSB, SocketCAN, or the Py3 hat. However, in some cases, Python doesn't make sense as the implementation language for an application. Many applications have either performance, memory, or OS constraints that prevent Python from being a suitable solution. This new C++ library provides a similar API to the Python one for simple applications, but also exposes the underlying layers, so that, for instance, you can use it to just encode and parse CAN messages without using the parts of the API that interact with the operating system. To show how this can be used, I've got a simple demo that has been kicking around the idea pile for quite a while. Gravity compensation. The thought is to build an arm or linkage that has a mass at the end, the motors in the linkage can be commanded with a torque that nearly exactly cancels out the effect of gravity, making the mass appear weightless. This is not new by any means and is a common technique for any practical robot arm. Here, I'm just using it as a motivating an example. I'm going to tackle this in two phases. The first one simple with just one axis and one servo, and the second more complex with more than one. Let's figure out the hardware setup first. To make things simple for me, I'm going to use either one or two Modius R4 controllers with MJ5208 motors and the dev kit bracket holding them together. To connect them and a mass into a linkage, I'll make a quick 3D printed beam that can mount to the MJ5208 on one end and the dev kit bracket on the other. Despite my better judgment, I decided to try this using FreeCAD. While I started my CAD career with FreeCAD a long time ago, I've been a Fusion 360 user for many years now. For unrelated reasons, I don't have access to Fusion right at this moment, so let's see how annoying FreeCAD is to operate today. The two biggest problems with FreeCAD and parametric modeling historically were the unbaked assembly support and the topological naming problem that makes non-trivial parametric models complex exercises in avoiding references to all generated geometry. It appears that in the five years since I last attempted using it, neither of these has really been resolved. Fortunately, I don't need to model an assembly here, and hopefully I can get things mostly right the first time, so the topological naming won't be that big of a problem. This here was my finished model, so I sliced and printed it. And these are the parts off the printer. For stage one, we'll just bolt the dev kit backwards onto its bracket, like so. Then attach the beam and then once the beam is attached, we'll attach the second dev kit bracket. And that is the extent of the plant for stage one. Only the first motor will be powered at all and the torque required to counteract gravity is simply the sign of the position multiplied by the torque when fully extended. Now let's get coding. I'm going to use CMake to show one way of incorporating the Modia C++ bindings. I'll make a blank CMake lists.txt file here to get started. And with CMake, the easiest way is to use the newish fetch content mechanism for which there's an example shown in the Modia CMake lists.txt file. 
Um, since the Modia C++ bindings are header only, no build steps at all are required. We'll just declare the git repository here, and then what hash we want to use. I'll just uh, go through the GitHub URL to figure out what hash we want to um, pull from. For now, just pull the most recent, which is often a totally fine option. So we'll get that pasted in. And then we need to make that repository available. So we'll use the fetch content available method. That exposes a modius colon colon cpp target, which we can link into our example. So I'll declare my target here. We'll say that it's going to link against the modius library we just imported, which should be the only library it needs. Now we'll get the source code started. Um, so I'll just open a blank gravity comp onecc file and we'll work on our initial includes. So I can include IO stream because we'll probably use C out. And we'll also use printf, so we'll do studio.h. And finally, I'll include modius.h. We have our main. And I'll say at this point that there isn't standalone documentation, but there are examples, and the source code is relatively readable. Here, I'll work from the simple.cc example as a way of uh, getting the baseline intact. So here, we'll call the default arg process method. Um, that will give our application a dash dash help and let the user configure the default transport. If you have more complex needs, looking here at the modius.h file, you can see there are other options for function calls you can use, including the um, there's one that lets you parse all the arguments that Modius knows about, and one that lets you figure out what those options are if you want to include them in your own help. Now I'm going to pull up uh, simple.cc in a separate Emacs buffer so we can more easily copy paste from it. Um, the next step here, well, before we do anything else, I'm going to try compiling this. So we'll make our CMake build. Well, we've got to return zero for main. We'll make a build directory, fire up CMake, try building it, and see if we have any compilation errors at this point. And miraculously, we don't. And so we can run it, and help works. So that means we have a minimal application which does a little bit of something. And as I said, this default arg process, you don't have to call it. It takes the command line arguments and configures a default transport. You can make the transport manually. If you want to do your own argument processing, you can use the other uh, command line options in, that are in the modius.h library. Process transport args um, is the most common one. It takes the arguments and returns all the ones that modius didn't use. Um, and so you can use that to if you have your own command line arguments. Our simple examples don't have any, so that really isn't a problem here. Um, and similarly, the CMD line under arguments is the method that tells you all the th extra, the, like the help message, if you are formatting your own help uh, or usage messages in your application. So with that out of the way, we'll get ready to instantiate a controller instance in the same way that it's done in the example. So there's just a capital C controller class. We'll make a variable of that um, type. Now, there are many options you can pass to that um, constructor. And they're all collated in an options class. Um, and so we're going to start that because we have some things to change. And importantly, for the, we're going to be using torque mode. 
Um, to use torque mode, we want to change what resolution and what values are fed with each position mode command. And so the option structure, you can change things like the ID, which we're going to leave at 1 for this example. But you can also set the format, which is the resolution in which things are sent for the query command, the position command, um, and the other potential command modes. And we need to change the uh, position mode format since we're using torque mode. Um, I'm going to switch now to try to look up the, well, the easy part is we don't need to send position and velocity. So let's do that first. So we can just say that the position is ignored and, well, this is going to be verbose. So let's just uh, make a little alias here. Um, so I'll make a PF alias for the position format so we don't have to type that out for all the different things we're going to change. So the position needs to be ignored. The velocity needs to be ignored. The torque we definitely do want to send, and we're going to send that with the feed forward torque with a float point re floating resolution. And for torque mode, we are going to work where we every command send a KP scale and a KD scale is zero. If you're wondering how you could know to do that, now we have the Modius reference manual. So let's pull that up. We'll go to the uh, GitHub for Modius, which we already were, but didn't have the right URL at. And we'll go to the reference documentation, and I'll just search for torque here. And a couple of places in, we'll get to the usage mode. So these d sections of the reference say the different things you want to consider for operating the controller in different modes. And for torque mode, we're going to use the mode where we send feed forward torque and send the KP scale and KD scale to zero, which means they have to be sent with some resolution doesn't really matter what, because zero can be represented just fine, even as an int 8. So we'll use int 8 to make it smaller. And that's looking all right. Maybe I'll uh, probably gonna use controller a lot, so we'll make that uh, not as long there. C will work. Um, as with most standalone examples, we want to send a stop command to the servo at the very beginning of the application in order to clear any faults that may exist. So if the last time you ran it, you had a position mode timeout because you exited the application, or if there was a under voltage or something. And so that set stop will clear the controller's faults and get it to a known state. Now I'm going to set up the default command that we're going to use for every command. Um, and so we'll declare the command structure, which is a position. It's actually supposed to be position mode, not position command. Um, we'll fix that later. And the substructure is command. And that has each of the fields we might want to send. And so the KP scale and the KD scale, as I mentioned, will always be 0. So we'll set them to 0 now. And we'll just default the feed forward torque to 0 for now. But in fact, we will change that each time through the loop. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about the command options. Like the Python library, for each of the possible commands, there are th different modes you can use. The set mode is a blocking call that sends the command and waits for the response before continuing. The make variant will just construct the can frame and return it to you for you to use that can frame later. And finally, the async variant will initiate the call and then invoke a callback from a random arbitrary thread when it's done. And so depending upon your application, you may use one or the other. Uh, at this point, we'll get the while true of our application going. And our basic structure for each loop is going to be to send the command we calculated in the previous loop and simultaneously query the state. Um, we're using the blocking API, so this will run as fast as it can. In some cases, that means that Linux could get unhappy if you're like on a Pi 3 hat transport, which also blocks. So we'll use a, put a usleep 10, which requires us to have included unistood.h. Um, now, as I said, if we want to command and query, we can just use set position and pass in the command structure we uh, declared earlier, and it will return an optional result because the servo may not exist, it may time out. 
And so that's why we'll call it maybe result. Because it may be a result, it may not be a result. We'll have to check for that. The first thing we'll do with that maybe result is see if it actually doesn't exist at all. So we'll just use the not operator there. And my plan is if we get a fixed number of consecutive timeouts, then we'll bail to a mode where we continually send a break command. So here I'll just declare a local variable misreplies, which is really like the consecutive misreplies, and increment it if we missed. And if we get more, if we get up to four, then we'll um, break out of our while true loop and print a moderately helpful message. And if we missed the command, but haven't yet gotten to more, th more than three, then we'll continue. So we just skip back through the loop and we try to set position again after our brief sleep. Um, and if we got a response, we'll just reset that consecutive missed replies back to zero. So now in our loop, we have a response from the device. Um, and eventually, we'll want to calculate our new torque. Before we do that, I'm going to implement our what, we, what happens if we get into a failure mode, like a timeout. And so we'll print a, that we enter in the fault mode. We'll have a second while true, where we have a sleep. And here, we just will call set break every time. And so that will put the controller in break mode, where it shorts all three phases together, which will take some of the energy out of the system. And 10 microseconds is kind of fast to send that. So we'll just do it, and say, um, you know, 50 milliseconds seems like a reasonable time to send the break command over and over again. All right. Now that we have this done, it's time to implement the actual control function, where we determine what torque to use. The feed forward torque will be calculated from the position. To get the position, we need to extract it from this maybe result um, vector or structure which the re result is this substructure which has both a can frame and a query result. So we want to get the values, which is the query result, which has the decoded individual elements that come back from the servo. And so that will have like position and velocity and whatever else we queried. Um, our commanded feed forward torque will normally be the position, which from Modius is returned in terms of revolutions. But the C++ math library needs it in radians. So we'll multiply it by 2 pi to get it in radians so that we can feed it to a sine function. And then we have to multiply that by the mass of the end, the link length, and the gravitational constant. So let's make some constants here, which we'll go and uh, declare now up above our loop. Um, the mass I measured beforehand, and the length we defined when we made the CAD model. Uh, so these are both just guesses or approximations, but they don't have to be too close because we'll test them. And for now, I'm going to set the mass at zero so that when we run it the first time, it actually will put out zero force for our testing purposes. We can always fix, we'll fix that up later. Um, the link length I know is actually 15 centimeters. So there's, we'll just leave that at 15 centimeters. And gravitational constant, 9.8. Um, Close enough. This is close, but it would be nice to be able to see what happens while it's running. So for that, I'll just print a status line every n cycle. So we'll make a status count, and then uh, every nth cycle we'll print out the status. So we'll make it be every hundredth cycle we print out the status. Then at the end of our loop, we can go and increment the status count, check if it's big enough. And if it is, then we'll um, reset our status count back to zero and print some stuff. Um, I'm going to use only a carriage return without a new line to keep it on the same line. Um, and we'll only print the mode for now. And so the mode we can get from the query result, the same as we got the position, um, although it is an enumeration and printf will need it as an int. So we'll just static cast it to an int. Now that we have the mode, let's say do the position, because that will also be useful. I'll just print it with some extra space at the beginning, so it will hopefully take up the same number of characters every line. And then we'll do our command torque. Um, 
similarly with a few extra spaces. So not from the servo, but our command torque will be the, um, yeah, we'll do command torque, and it'll be from our command feed forward torque. And then there's a chance this could get hot if we run it for a long time, and so we'll print out the sensed temperature from the board as well. Um, it only needs one decimal point because Temperature will probably only be actually, if it's red as an in date, it only has either a 0 or 0.5 anyway. And then we'll flush and we don't need the colon colons because we're not using them anywhere else. I think that's basically what we need. So let's try compiling this and see what works or more importantly, what doesn't work. Um, that was a lot of code to type about compiling. Let's see, line 15, uh, we forgot an equal sign. So let's fix that on line 15. And then line 26 was the aforementioned position command, should be position mode. And that might be it, let's try it and see. Ha, worked. and run it, and the motor's not on, so it immediately times out. Yay. Before running it, we need to configure our motors. We'll need to calibrate and set the zero offset. Dev kits from MJBots come pre-calibrated, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to do it again. You just have to make sure there's nothing connected to it, which there clearly is now. So we'll assume that it's good. Um, next, we'll need to set the zero point. This example assumes that the zero position is when the beam is hanging directly down. We can see here that the position is actually at like minus 0.35 when it's hanging straight down. And we'll need to fix that up so it's exactly zero. So to do that, we'll close TView and run Modius tool with the ID and the dash dash zero dash offset. And that should save in persistent memory the current position as the zero position. So now we'll open up TView again and check that position to see where it's at. And if we're, we did it right, it should be about zero. And yep, it's pretty much exactly zero now. And we can verify that clockwise is positive and counterclockwise is negative, which is what we need. This example doesn't use the PID controller, only torque control. So there are no other constants or anything else that need configuring or tuning. So we'll just leave all of these constants as they are. And we do have to make sure that the I limit is zero um, because uh, we can't turn that off on a per command basis. All right, to make sure this is safe, our current um, mass is zero. So we're not gonna actually send any commands for the very first time, which is what we want. And now we can try running it and see what happens. Um, and this should always command zero torque, but we should verify that as the position becomes positive, it reads a positive position and reads a negative position. That the position sign and magnitude seems to make sense. So let's go through and now set it up where it will print what the torque would be, but it won't still always send zero torque. So we'll set the mass back to some fraction of the actual mass and then we'll um, set our torque to be uh, zero for now. So we'll calculate a command torque and for the purposes of right now, ignore it. So that way it will print out the right value and we we'll can just print the calculated command torque, not what we're sending. That should compile just fine, we'll run it, and now we can verify that the torque we're commanding makes sense. So it should get positive when the position is positive until it max out at around 90 degrees and negative, it'll go negative. The torque max out at 90 degrees and then goes back to zero by the time you reach the top. And similarly for the positive direction, it maxes out at 90 degrees. And when you make it all the way to the top, it's back to zero. So that also makes sense. I think we're set now. We'll control C that to kill it and go back through and actually command the torque we just asked about. Now this is only half the torque. 
because we set our mass at half of the actual mass. I'm going to also up my current limit on the power supply so we're ready to go for any eventuality. Um, it's currently unpowered. We will run it and if all worked well I'm going to hold on to it just in case it decided to do something silly when it started but it didn't. And now as I lift it up we see that it, it definitely weighs less. At least it feels like it weighs less. The motor is taking some of the load, although it's still, you can definitely feel weight associated with it. But this seems all as expected for if we're commanding half the torque you would need to hold it upright. It still rocks back and forth. Um, period, you know, kind of disconnected from reality, uh, but it does rock back and forth. So now let's take our mass and inch back up on the actual mass. So we'll go up to 0.25 for now. And when we run it now, it feels pretty lightweight. In fact, it can almost hold still in some positions. There it does hold still. And not everywhere does it hold still. So that means it's probably slightly too small. Um, but it takes very little force to lift it up. Uh, and there it still falls down. So it's likely a little bit too low still um, for the mass. And it seems to make sense near the top. It also can hold position just barely and maybe not quite, but still takes very little force. So remember, this is relatively heavy. And if it wasn't being actively powered, it would just fall and shake around like a, a 300 gram block of metal at the end of the stick. Um, but this seems like it's working pretty well. Um, let's stop that here then and we'll creep up our mass a little bit more we'll try going up to say 0.27 which is just a hair a bit more than it was and we'll try and see what that looks like and at 0.27 oh, it's running away from me so that's probably too high so it will it's rising up like a updraft um, so it's commanding more torque than the there's actually mass on the end of it so let's drop that down to halfway point, 0.26, and give it a try. And there it'll hold still, there it holds still, there it holds still, uh, there it holds still. Seems to hold still just about anywhere we leave it. Um, the MJ528 has some cogging torque, so it's we haven't canceled it out, so there's still a little bit of a minor amount of cogging torque, but you can just spin it. And it goes around just like it was on a flat surface instead of moving up and down against gravity. And it takes virtually zero force to make it move. And this is one of the nice things about a direct drive motor is that it's very torque transparent. And so when you see some inverse kinematics or some gravity compensation demos, it actually takes a fair amount of force to make it move and it will hold its position. Where here, you can see that it's uh, very responsive and moves with just a flick of a hand and there's but since there's no actual um, damping force it will just keep moving until whatever you know imperfections in the control result in either falling or getting stuck in a cogging torque valley but this is a lot of fun to play with it just bounces around you can use the tiniest force to push it one way or the other no matter where it is on the no matter where it is on the spin, you can just give it a whack and have it go around in either direction with just the, the lightest touch. It's really pretty fun to play with. That's the kind of thing that you eventually you have to stop. <laughs> And there, now that it's off, you can see it just falls right to the ground. It's actually pretty heavy again, even though the, the brake mode is on. Um, with the brake mode off, it tends to uh, vibrate much faster. The weight is still the same when you lift it up, but it uh, um, oscillates much faster. That's it for this first video. Look in the description for the link to the second video where we tackle a two degree of freedom system.